Megan's going to first plug in the power to this peel box, and power needs to be plugged into the numbered port that you want to assign within the software for a peeler. So we're configuring this as number 48. It's plugged into number 48. All she does is place it on the rail and turn that one Allen screw until it's snug. Okay, so Megan's got the peeler on. Now she's going to put the feeder on. First thing you got to do is plug that into a port, but the feeders are addressed by the software with a code, so they actually don't have to be plugged into the numbered port. You can plug it wherever it's convenient to uh, get the wire, actually. Um, it's simpler if you plug it into the numbered port, just for your own peace of mind, but uh, we're, we're going to have to assign an ID to this feeder before it will be controlled by the software. And again, one Allen nut, snug it up, and the feeder's installed. Now we're going to cut to the software because when you install feeders, it's very important to install one at a time and then give the feeder its ID. This is because when the feeders arrive from the factory, they are programmed with an ID of number 50. We need to change that ID to the one we want to use uniquely with that feeder, and if we have two feeders plugged in with ID 50, we're going to send that change signal to two feeders, so we, we definitely don't want to do that. Each time you install a feeder, then change the ID. So we're going to do that now. Megan's going to go to System Setup. She's going to click Modify Feeder ID, and then up comes this, this cool set of two menus that allows you to change any feeder ID to any other feeder ID. So we're going to start because this one is, is new. It is assigned number 50, and we installed it in position 48. So she's just going to change it to 48 and click Modify. And that's it. Let's take a look at the software interface. When you power on the machine, this is the first screen you see. It has three simple tabs, pick and place programming, manual test, and system setup. We're going to start with system setup just so that you can see how to set up the feeders. So we go to system setup and we have four sub tabs. The SMD configuration tab lets us match feeders and peelers. Remember that the, the feeders are assigned codes and are independent of the port they're plugged into. The peelers are dependent on the port they're plugged into. So you can create combinations by simply choosing different feeders and peelers in this interface. The first thing we've got to do is tell the camera where the uh, components are in the feeders so that we can align the nozzles to them. And once we have the camera aligned, the nozzles align automatically. So let's, let's click to align, and this is what we see. We have the tape. We don't have any components in here yet because we haven't exhausted the leader. Uh, but we have a tape that has the slots for the components, and we can see it very clearly on the camera. So what we want to do is make sure that we are in the center of the hole in the tape where the component will sit. So we, we take our crosshairs and put it in the center, and the camera realigns. If we want to bring this down a little bit just to make it perfect, the camera realigns. We save this position, and that feeder is now aligned. If I go to these tabs, feeder configuration, and peeler configuration, we can set how far the feeder feeds uh, based on the spacing of the components in the tape, and we can also set the strength of the feeding action. Sometimes certain tapes react better to more or less torque. Uh, I usually find that the paper tapes take more torque and the plastic tapes uh, take a little less, but the default is 50 and we'll leave that there for now. If we press click to calibrate, uh, what's going to happen is that the feeder will actually advance quite far. It'll, it'll advance many inches of, of tape, and so it's best to do this when you have no tapes installed. But what this will do is have the feeder automatically tell you if 
the gears are returning to the right position, and it also helps loosen up the gears after shipping. So when you're installing, sometimes it's nice to click that. If we click to test on the feeder configuration page, only the feeder will advance. If we click to test on the SMD configuration page, both the feeder and the peeler will advance. Now let's go to peeler configuration. We have a feeding rate column here that tells roughly how far the peeler will attempt to peel the tape back. Now you might ask, why are we peeling back 16 millimeters if we're only advancing four? And that's because there's some slippage with the tape in the peeler. Um, that, that tape can vary a lot in consistency. It can even vary based on humidity. So we have a wide variety of peel rates that we can use. Sometimes you'll find, especially when using a plastic tape, that the feeding rate of the peeler needs to be very conservatively set because otherwise it will try to lift up the plastic tape and knock parts out. So you have, you have a lot of flexibility here, both in the strength and in the distance of the peeling to make sure that, that the tape separates from the component side of the tape evenly and smoothly. The default strength rate on the peelers is 80. I usually find 50 is a good starting place, so I'm gonna set these to 50 for our four tape feeders that we're gonna to use today. and we'll test these in just a moment. We have all of our feeders matched up with all of our peelers. We have our peelers configured, and so now we are ready to align and test. We can either test from this interface by clicking this, but it's often more useful to align and then do the same operation while looking at the camera. So the camera's a still camera, not a video camera, and you'll notice that when I press feed, the tape will advance to the next slot in the tape and things will look just ever so different. We're gonna keep advancing using the feed command and watching the screen until we actually see components under the camera. Okay, so here we go. So now we see our components and you can see this one is a little diagonal in the slot. This one's pretty straight. That's why we want to select the center of the slot for our pick location and then let the upward looking camera determine how the pick actually worked out so that it can correct for any small inaccuracies. So we'll save this because we're happy with the location and go to the next feeder. And so here we have a larger component that will center. We'll save that alignment. But we'll go back and watch now the tape advance until we get our components. Okay, so again, we have our components. These are 0603 resistors, and we're ready to move to the next feeder. And this one is already pretty darn close. We'll just make it, we'll just put it there. And then we will feed this. Now we'll just save that and then go on to number four. So that's good. So we'll save that. Okay, so now we have our four tape feeders that we've set up all aligned and we're pretty much ready to go. I will point out that on the system setup tab, the buttons you're going to use most often for system configuration uh, itself are here on the right. The save button, obviously we want to save the configurations that we've established with our X and Y coordinates for the center of each tape. The configuration password is available if we want to set some parameters here, but we don't recommend that you do that without uh, talking to tech support because they affect very, very fine critical alignment of the nozzles and normally aren't necessary to use. So we'll go back here to SMD configuration. We also have the modify feeder ID button that Megan used earlier to assign codes to feeders one at a time. The software upgrade button is used if there's a software upgrade available, which we would send to you. Uh, th these files can actually be emailed and placed on a, and when the thumb drive's in the machine, uh, we just push software upgrade button 
and we'll see a file if we have one uh, to upgrade. I'm not going to upgrade right now because this machine is already upgraded to the latest version. The Chinese button I advise you not to press unless you actually uh, read Chinese because that will change the language to Chinese and then to change it back each motherboard has a unique password that has to be generated by tech support. So try and stay away from that button. Okay, having gone through these pages and we're happy with the way everything's feeding, so our default values for feeding rate and strength and peeling rate and strength turn out to be really good, we're going to go to our manual test page. The manual test page gives you access to test the left and right feeder banks. Here we have, for this demo, feeders 1 through 4 set up, and we've also installed feeder 48. Okay, so the next area of the manual test screen is the placement head area, which allows us to control or test each function of the nozzle. If we do this for nozzle 1, if we use the blow function, we get a little puff of air, and you'll notice a little change in the positive value of the pressure indicator, and that's not going to be a major change. If we want to use the suck function to test the vacuum pump, uh, we need to put our finger over one of the nozzles, and uh, Megan's going to do that right now. And you see, when she has her finger over it, we get a nice surge of a, a negative value. That tells us that the vacuum pump's working. Turn left and turn right. If you look at the top of the head, you can see the vacuum tubes moving back and forth. That tells us that the rotational axis is working. And nozzle down will bring the nozzle uh, down its full extent until you release the button. Flash tests the lighting system. It toggles on and off. And photograph will simply move the head and take a picture of whatever is under the camera at the time. The move head button has three ways of moving the head. The first is visual field, which allows us, if we treat the crosshairs as the center, we can move the head around using the camera. All right, and you'll see right here that we actually found a feeder. We go to mouse vectors. Mouse vectors treats the screen as a map of the entire table, and then we can coarsely move the head to wherever we want on the table. Keyboard jog allows us to use the arrow key to make very, very tiny adjustments, but usually you'll find that the camera works better. Alignment method, unless we're setting one of the back feeders, we're always going to use the camera to align because it's just so much easier. And then the speed slider tells us how fast the movements are. The rail controls allow us to move the, the rails forward and backward to, to make sure those are working. So uh, Megan's going to place a board in the rails right now, and we'll see how that works. We can see the board moving through. We can move it backwards to eject it. So everything's good there. And then the host control allows us to turn on the vibration feeder, uh, which we'll do when we make our board. And then also we have a couple of buttons. We can certainly test our buzzer and feed and flash we've covered, but we also have a couple of buttons here that are useful in case the head crashes into something that shouldn't have been on the table. We see here XY status idle. If we ever see an error there, and I never have, clear XY will restore that. And if we want to make sure that, that because there's been some abnormal activity on the table that the head is aligned with the machine home, we can press home and it will home just like the, the power on sequence. So that's our manual test screen. And that takes us now to the main event, which is pick and place programming screen. We have a demo file set up here. I'm gonna use that to make the board, but I wanted to show you exactly how we get there. And so let's first take a look at these buttons on the bottom. We have some file management buttons that are fairly self-explanatory. It would allow us to export and import files from the uh, USB drive. We can delete a file. We can copy one or create a new one. If we want to rename it, we just click on the file name and we can type in a new name. So for right now, let's start with a new program. We'll give it new file name one which is the default, and select it. 
And now we have our two main screens, the edit screen, which is where we do the programming, and the mount screen, which is where we run the program. So let's start with edit. We get PCB information and feeder settings tabs. The first one, PCB information, we have to set up for all our components. But first, let's take a look at the left side. We've got the rail single button checked because we're going to do one board at a time using the rail system. If we want to do a manual placement, meaning we're not going to use the rails, we'd click magnetic fixture and then it won't try to operate the rail system to make the board when it runs the program. We also have a decision to make whether we want the board to eject from the front, if we're sitting in front of the machine, that's convenient, or from the rear, which is often used if we're using a conveyor to take the finished board directly into the reflow oven. When we press align, we get a picture of what's in the rails, and we do that to find the front edge of the board when we first create our program. Don't need to do that when we're running the program. It'll detect the edge of the board automatically, but we first need to tell it where we want the board to be. So let's do that. We'll feed the board in. And now we'll align it. So we want to click right here on the edge of the board so that it knows where the edge is and save that setting. And you can see that the coordinates have changed slightly based on where the board was. And we have the ability to move that forward and backwards if we have a long board and we want it to be in a certain position. I've chosen this location because it's near the feeders and that'll just make for faster assembly. The next thing we need to do is populate our component list before we go any further. And here's a very important thing about this machine. The origin for purposes of any program is going to be the first component in the program. If you're going to use an export program from your PCB design software, it'll likely be alphabetical, and so it'll often be a capacitor. So let's assume that's going to be C1. We need to find where C1 is on the board as our first order of business. So we're going to create a new component called C1, and we could do this by the import that I'll show you later. But for right now, let's create a component by pressing new. We will name it C1. We'll add a value for it. We'll give it a footprint, which in this case will be 0805. And we don't know where the X and Y coordinates are yet, but we're going to find that with the camera. So if we press align, we're going to get a picture of the table. And if we move that down, we're going to start seeing the components on the board. And now you can start seeing we have our components very sharply photographed. We know roughly where C1 is going to be by looking at the board, and there it is. So now we've got this nicely centered right where the center of C1 is, and we save that. And we now have our coordinates entered in here as uh, X and Y coordinates. So we know now where the origin of our file is. We know that we aren't going to want to skip this component, so we have no there. Uh, for rotation, we can just leave that at zero right now because uh, we don't yet know, because we haven't imported our list, what the rotation is going to be. But now that we have that number, first thing we need to do is make sure that it is entered as the origin for all parts of the software that need it. So we're going to copy those numbers because we're just doing one board here. You can do a panelized list. Uh, by specifying the number of rows and columns, and then specifying the right top, left top, and left bottom of the entire panel. And that's really convenient because it can duplicate the entire program for every board on the panel. But for right now, we're going to be doing a single board, so let's just take that first value and copy it in. We've got x is 338.70. Okay. Our y value is 131.79 as determined by the camera. 
and we're going to leave angle detect alone. Uh, for some rare uses where you might have a crooked board, this function can allow you to align it, but it's usually easier just to leave this at zero, zero, zero. The next thing we're going to do, even though we don't have a panel, we're going to click create panelized list and skip past the, there's no panel information entered because of course we're just doing one board. And then it automatically populates these values with the values from our origin. So these values for the first component have to be in all three of these places for the program to work. Next, we've got our fiducials. Now the fiducials are little circles that we have silk screened on the board usually about one to two millimeters in diameter. And we've got to identify where those are so that it can check to make sure that each board is where it needs to be when it's fed into the machine. For right now, we're going to click Manual and click New. And then we're going to click Position Align. That gives us C1 because that's where the camera is right now, but we need to find, I like to start with the bottom left fiducial, so we'll go southwest here on the board to find where that fiducial is. Oh, it went too far, and there it is. So we click anywhere in there, but we want that to be perfect. So this is the area where we use the auto align button because it can find the center of a circle very nicely, and there you have it. So you press save, and we're done with that one. We have two fiducials on this board, so we're gonna press new, and we have to align the second one, which is roughly in the northeast quadrant of the board. So we'll scan across our board, looking for that fiducial. And there it is. We'll auto-align it and save it. Want to make sure that manual isn't checked if we're using the rail uh, system. And since we only have two fiducials, we are now done with that. So it's time to get our component list. And we can do that in a couple of ways. We can do it manually by adding components and entering their values and finding them with the camera. But the easier way, if you have a, a script or an export to CSV from your PCB design software, is just to import it. So let's take manual off for a moment, and we'll do file import. We have our little demo board here, all exported from Eagle using a script. And we just click Save. Voila. All of the components are now populated with the values based on the value we found for the first component. And that's very, very convenient. The PCB software has filled in the rotation for each component. It's filled in the X and Y coordinates and the footprints. Now, I didn't have values entered in this program, but we won't need them for this video. We'll now click manual again so that we can align components precisely. One of the things about PCB design software is it gives us exactly the components that it thinks that the board should have. And the board manufacturers are very good at coming up with something pretty close to that. But could they be off by a hundredth of a millimeter? They absolutely could. So what we're going to do is check each one of these values with the camera to make sure we are dead center. So now we have our component list, and let's see how close we are on our alignment. Okay, so now we're ready to check and see how good the PCB design software and the board maker actually were. So we've got C1, we know where that is. Let's go to C2. It's a little bit off. So we can click that and save, and C3. get that just right, and so on and so forth, until we know that our components are going to land exactly where they're supposed to. I'm just going to run through this really fast.
Okay, so now we've got our, all of our components aligned. And the next thing we need to do, good idea to save this, is to go to our feeder settings and make sure that we assign our feeders. Now one thing you can do is just assign all the feeders sequentially, assuming that you have your feeders in the same numerical and alphabetical order, that'll work great. But we don't have that, so we're going to manually assign each feeder and nozzle. So for feeder one, we're going to choose an R402. We're going to go back here. And there's a convenient feature that you can use to automatically assign these if you have all the values entered the exact same way in the component list and in the feeder list. But since we don't have that right now, We'll simply say that feeder 1 is the 0402, feeder 2 is the 0603, feeder 3 is the 0805 capacitor, feeder 4 is the 1206 resistor, and now we have these assigned. For each one of these feeders then, we go in here, we click apply, and we have the ability to assign nozzles and to, again, set some of our feeder parameters if we want, uh, to make sure that our feeder is aligned as it should be. So let's check that, and it's perfect. Now here we have our pick angle. This auto-populates based on where the uh, component is in the machine. So if we're using a left side feeder, it will auto-populate as 90, and if we're using a right side feeder, feeder it will auto-populate as minus 90. But that's, that's already done for us now. Next thing, and this is critical, we have to set the, the pick height and the, the place height to make sure that the nozzle makes a nice smooth contact with the part and doesn't slam the part hard down on the board because these things are like pumpkin seeds. And if you slam the nozzle down too hard, the part will slip out when it hits that moist solder. So the way we do that is we press a line, we see that, and then we use the slider here. Notice that when we click the slider, the height starts at 12. So there's 12 millimeters of total travel. And these are absolute values of total travel. And we need to find exactly where the nozzle comes down and touches the component. So to do that, we're going to select a nozzle. And for these 0402s, I'm using <coughs> nozzle 3, which is a very, very fine nozzle. Press nozzle 3, and we have 12 millimeters of total travel. The, the maximum component uh, height for this machine, by the way, is 5 millimeters. But we have 12 millimeters total travel, and we can use this slider to bring the nozzle down until it makes contact with the component. So, And there's a spring in the nozzle, so we can be a little bit um, gentle with our setting and we're, we're getting a height of about 1.7. So now that we know what that value is, we're gonna cancel out of here and enter it in the pick height field. The pick delay and place delay allow uh, a little pause after the nozzle makes contact with the part uh, or is about to leave contact with the part after it moves. And that's handy because it gives the vacuum a chance to stabilize. So I like to enter a value of about 100 milliseconds. It doesn't take too long, uh, but 100 milliseconds delay can actually enhance the accuracy of the pick and place operations tremendously. Next thing we have to do is find how high the, the part should be when on the board. So to do that, we're going to tell it we're going to use nozzle 3 for this part. So we'll select nozzle 3, and we're going to pick up a part. Nozzle goes down, and it picks up a part. Now what we'd like to do, and this, this is a technique I prefer, is let's move the head over and, and see if we can place that part 
on the board and see what height it should be. So we'll go over to a component that's one of those 0402 resistors we're going to use, and we'll click a line. <laughs> that takes us to where that part is. Now, this is the camera over that part, not the nozzle. They are calibrated internally. But for Z height, all we really need to do is lower the uh, nozzle onto a part of the board. And for, for our purposes, we need to bring the, the head a, a little bit toward the front of the machine. So, and over here, so that we can uh, get the nozzle onto the board. And we'll lower it down using nozzle three. Then we'll lower nozzle three down until we just hear a click, until the part is making contact with the board. We don't want it any lower than that click. So here, our, our click is telling us that we are at about 2.6 millimeters. Now, obviously, that part isn't almost a millimeter thick, but that's okay because these are absolute values and they're based on where the board is in the z-axis and where the component happens to be in the z-axis. The part thickness is a factor, but not the only factor. So we cancel this and we now know that we need to go to feeder settings and, and feeder one is going to be placed at 2.6. Now, the move speed can be very, very fast. And, and so for most feeders, I like to set them at about 60% so that there's no disruption of the part while it's attached to the nozzle. Vacuum discard is a way of detecting whether there's a part attached to the nozzle by measuring the vacuum. We can set a threshold for each nozzle. And if it doesn't detect that much vacuum once it tries to do a pick operation, uh, the machine is going to eject any part that's there and try and pick again. Normally, I think it's better just to use individual vision alignment so that we can really verify not only that a part's there, but how it's oriented. Size correct is a very sensitive feature that detects the footprint, but is normally not necessary. So I wouldn't check that. I wouldn't check this. We have a footprint here, so I'll enter 0402. And we have now completed setting up this feeder. So, we will save this, and I'm going to try and run through the rest of these. The next thing we're going to set up is the chips we're using. And to do that, we're going to use tray-fed chips, although for this demo, I'm, I've actually configured them as short tapes. This is kind of a neat feature because when you don't want to buy uh, a whole tray or a whole reel of some expensive components, you can simply take a little snippet, as we've done here, and I've used the magnetic fixtures with some extra PCBs as a stand and double stick taped the short tapes there. Now, of course, you could use a, a normal tray, but we're doing this just to show you the flexibility of the machine. Our special feeders are, are the numbers above 48. So I'm gonna start and make this chip feeder number 98. We'll click apply, and then we have to tell it how many columns and how many rows we have in the feeder. Well, we have two columns, so we'll click two, and we have five rows, so we'll click five. We now need to tell it where our uppermost right component is, which we'll do with the camera. Speed things up, we'll select mouse vectors and get over generally to that part of the table and click visual field. And sure enough, here are our parts. Okay. We'll go to the upper right component, which is right here. And we think we're pretty close to the center, but this is a big component and the camera zoomed out as far as it can be. So we'll just use nozzle two, which is our, our larger nozzle, and move it down. And sure enough, we're right in the center with nozzle two. While we're here, we'll also check our, our pick height, which because we're using a thicker component on a different surface is, is actually 4.8 cancel out of here and 
Okay, so the camera got us pretty close, but this part is too big because we're already zoomed out as far as we can go, and we, we know we're close. But let's check this. We'll use nozzle <coughs> 2, which is the large nozzle I've installed for this part. We'll lower the nozzle down, and sure enough, we're, we're good in the center of that uh, component. And we also know that our pick height is going to be about 4.7, 4.8. So <coughs> we'll note these coordinates, uh, the x and y coordinates and we'll enter them for the upper right component. Next thing is we need the opposite corner, the lower left, and that's over here in feeder basic information. We will align this using the same method. <laughs> because I've showed you what to do with the camera, I'm just going to use mouse vectors to jog this nozzle right over pretty close. Then we will just select visual field so we can have some smaller, finer movements, and move it to the center of the component. Look at that. We're right in the center. So we'll save this, and these values are now populated in that corner. We can select our pick angle depending on how we have our components aligned. I'm going to leave it at zero for right now. And we also want to make sure that we have our Z information. So we'll drag this down again. And we're at about 4.4, so we'll enter 4.4 on our pick height. Do our pick delay. And for these larger components, because they're heavier and they might not react as well to the vacuum, I like to make the speed much slower. So we'll go 30 on the, on the speed. And we still have to set our place height. So we're using nozzle 2 for this feeder that we've created. And we'll just go pick up a component with nozzle 2. And there it is. Next, of course, we have to go over to the board and see what the place height is. So we'll align this, use our mouse vectors to make a big move over to the board. It doesn't really matter where we are on the board because we're just concerned with the vertical axis. So using nozzle 2 again, we will drag this down, wait for our click, and our click is at uh, 2.9. I'll go 2.8 just to be safe. Cancel out of here and enter 2.8. And we've now set up a feeder with this array of components. And these could be placed in any arbitrary location on the board. If they're not quite straight, the machine will correct based on interpolating where the parts are. It's really pretty amazing what sort of flexibility you have. You can place them anywhere on the table and create your own array uh, with whatever you happen to have. Tapes, trays, you name it. So right now, I'm going to pop this off here. And the last feeder we're going to set up today is a tube feeder. The tube feeders are configured as numbers 49 through 53. So I'm going to go down here to feeder 49, we'll click apply, and all I need to do is align it using the camera. That's the actual tube, so let's get a component. Scoot it on over here. And this is a little a little off, but that's okay because the vision system will correct for it. But we'll put it right about here, save that, and we now have the coordinates for the tube feeder. When we run this program, we're going to turn on the vibration feeder, and those parts will automatically drop out of the tube right into the area where we just assigned the coordinates. So we'll save this. So the first thing we needed to do is, is assign all our feeders. And we can do this automatically if we have two matching lists from our values and, and our footprints. But since I didn't enter values in here, since this board doesn't actually do anything, it's just a demo, I'm going to use the manual feature. And I know that my 0805s are in feeder number 3. My 0603s are in feeder number 2. So I'm just going to make these 2. down. Okay, so those are our 
0603s. Our 1206s are in feeder four, so we'll assign those. And um, lastly, our 0402s are in feeder one. So we'll just make all of these one. Okay, so the rest of these are one. Lastly, we have our two chips. So we have right here our TQFP40, which is in the tray feeder we created. And by the way, you can create as many tray feeders as you like to have lots and lots of different short tapes if that's what you need to do. And we made that feeder number 98, so we'll enter that here. And we made our tube feeder, feeder 49, so we'll enter that here for our couple of tube-fed chips. And we've got it. Now we know that we're using nozzle two for our, our larger chips, so we'll assign nozzle two. And we know we're using nozzles one and four for our 0402s, so we'll alternate nozzles one and four to give us the most efficiency. And for our 1206s, we're gonna be using nozzle number three Now I have these arranged by size just for convenience, but you can move these parts up and down or get rid of parts in the list just using these buttons. All right, and for our 0603s, let's go with nozzles one and four again, because that's a nice small nozzle for nice small components. And you can configure these nozzles any way you want. I just happen to put them in in that order. But you may decide that you want no duplicate nozzles, all different sizes, or you may decide that you want all the same size. A lot of nozzles come with the machine, and we can always get you more if you want a special mix of sizes. All right. So now we have all our nozzles assigned, and we have all our components assigned. We'll save this file. We've looked at our feeder settings. We know what to do for each one of those, except we also need to set our pick height, and we need to assign the components for these feeders. So feeder 49, we will assign to this chip, because that's the one in the tube feeder. And then our other special feeder is feeder 98, which we will assign to this chip, and get our height for tube feeder just by aligning that and we're going to use nozzle two we'll just drop this down see when it makes contact and so this is much lower so we're down around 0 0.5 so we're going to enter 0 0.5 that's already there we'll do our pick delay And since I know what my board height is, I'm going to choose a nice conservative 2.8 for my placement height, since we've done enough components that we know that. And we can choose footprints for these. You can also create a footprint just by entering the measurements of your part if you don't find that your part is there but we can approximate because the camera is good enough to do that. Now, the only thing we may want to do here for this larger chip is choose large component for the vision alignment. We save the file, check our work, and now we should be ready to make a PCB. Now we're actually going to try and run this board. We're going to cancel out of the edit section of the PMP programming interface and click mount. Now we have our program up and really all we have to do is turn on our vibration feeder because we are using a tube. That's on. 
we'll have Megan put the board right into the rail feeder. And there you go. And we will click start. <laughs> Okay, so that's it. We've built a board. Uh, it's got 71 components. We did it in a matter of just a couple of minutes. And uh, from where I'm sitting, everything looks like it's placed exactly right. Uh, let's eject it and find out. Eject it now. And take a look. Not too bad, huh? That's 0402, 0603, 0805, 1206, TQFP40, and SOP8 all placed automatically that easily.